Good morning and welcome. My name is May Cannon. I'm the Executive Director of Churches for Middle East Peace. And I'm so pleased to be here with some of the religious leaders from the Middle East, from Lebanon and from Palestine. I'm pleased to introduce them to you and to give you the opportunity to be able to ask some questions and to hear from them directly, particularly as we come together this second week of Advent, which is such a special time for us as Christians around the world. I'd love to introduce you um, to all three of them and then give them an opportunity to say hello before we get started. Um, first, we have Reverend Dr. Mitri Rahab joining us from Bethlehem in Palestine. He's the founder and president of Dar al Kalima University College of Arts and Culture in Bethlehem. He's the most widely published Palestinian theologian um, with several books to date. I hear that some of them are on my shelf uh, and have read them and would encourage you to read his work. Reverend Dr. Rahab is the recipient of the prestigious Olaf Palm Prize and the To-Do Award for Socially Responsible Tourism and the Wittenberg Award for Distinguished Service to Church and Society. He's a social entrepreneur with great, great contributions to the Palestinian people uh, and the realities of what are happening in Bethlehem. Welcome, Mitri. Thank you, May, and salam to all from the little town of Bethlehem. Yes, sometimes when I tell people about Bethlehem, I say Bethlehem like the real one, not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So correct, correct. We're eager to hear what's happening um, in your community. Uh, then we have with us Reverend Najla Kassab. Uh, she's the president of the World Communion of Reformed Churches, director of the Christian Education Department for the National Synod of Syria and Lebanon. She has her BA in Christian Education from NEST, the Near East School of Theology, her Masters of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, and in 1993, Reverend Kassab received the first preaching license offered to a woman by the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon. Uh, in March 2017, she became the second woman to be ordained as a minister by the same group. And for the past two and a half decades, Reverend Kassab has worked um, with the Synod Women's and Children's Ministries, including as Director of Christian Education. She was elected to the WCRC Executive Committee in 2010, uh, the Uniting General Council, and she lives with her husband, Joseph Kassab, three children in Beirut, and her work takes her frequently to Syria. Welcome, Reverend Najla. Thank you, Mie. I'm so happy to be with you. We're eager to hear more about your ministry and your work. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And then Thank you very much. We have also with us Father Dr. Michel Jalac, who's an Antonin monk in the Maronite Catholic Church. Before we started, we were just talking about some of the differences between Eastern Catholicism uh, and the Catholic Church here in the West. He serves as the Secretary General of the Middle East Council of Churches. He's dedicated his life and career to the study of the special role of Eastern Christianity and to advancing the ecumenical movement, especially in the Middle East. Father Dr. Michel is president of the Antonin University in Lebanon and is an external expert on the World Council of Churches peace building in situations of violence theme group and the Pontifical Council for promoting Christian unity. Uh, welcome, Father Michel. Thank you, thank you, and greetings, Advent greetings from Beirut also, thank you. Yes, I'm so pleased we can all be connected via this technology. Maybe we'll start with Father Dr. Michel. Can you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit? We see a Christmas tree behind you. It's the second week in Advent and you're joining us from Beirut. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Yes, well, uh, we, are, we are living now uh, our, uh, we are living now the Christmas, uh, the Christmas uh, time. And it's very important for us, uh, and we are preparing also as university, not only also as uh, as uh, Middle East Council of Churches, as everyone here in this um, in this in these countries. You know, for us, Christmas is um, is a special feast uh, for uh, for the Christians in the Middle East, and uh, to prepare it, it's uh, it's a uh, we have to live to live a hope, a joy of this uh, of this feast. This is Emmanuel and uh, God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Yes, thank you. And Reverend Najla, uh, tell us a bit, please introduce yourself. Tell us a bit about your work. You know, our hearts are with Christians in the Middle East and, of course, in Syria as well, where your work takes you often. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I'm honored that I work with the grassroots of the church and I work between Lebanon and Syria. 
And in this Advent season, the season of waiting and being patient uh, in waiting, it's a special season to us, especially as Middle Easterners. You know, uh, I grew in waiting in this part of the world and waiting uh, to celebrate peace, waiting to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ and to live in hope, to stay in hope. And uh, whenever I look at the time that Jesus was born, uh, I see similar uh, situations uh, of difficult waiting that was happening at that time even. So happy Advent season to all of you. Yes, thank you. Our theme this Advent for Churches for Middle East Peace is choosing hope. And in light of the current realities, it feels often like hope is distant on the horizon. And so in the spirit of Advent, I love your words of waiting, that we wait for Christ to come and to enter into this current reality. Well, let's turn our eyes to Bethlehem. Uh, Reverend Dr. Mitri um, would love to have an introduction from you from the little town of Bethlehem. Yeah. Um... It's uh, good to be with you. And uh, here at uh, Dal Kalima University College, uh, I'm surrounded with uh, young uh, uh, Palestinian, uh, vibrant, creative future leaders uh, that are engaged in the arts and in culture, uh, and uh, who really believe that um, they can transform the world uh, through art and culture. Um, and um, I mean, uh, looking around at what's happening, uh, just uh, a few blocks away, there are uh, demonstration, there are uh, Israeli soldiers are throwing tear gas, um, but uh, nothing will deter us uh, from uh, uh, living uh, hope um, and I believe uh, that hope is not what we see, uh, but hope is what we do. In fact, in fact, um, uh, in, at Bright Stars of Bethlehem, our organization in the U.S., this is our tagline: "Hope is what we do." So we are not waiting here uh, to to wait for the Messiah, uh, who is Trump in this case, uh, because we believe our Messiah came two thousand years ago. Uh, and uh, so it's now time for action. <laughs> well, and um, the reason we convened is we wanted to talk to Christian leaders in the Middle East during this time of Advent, you know, from living in the, the place where our very faith began, um, from, you know, the Holy Land. And so we wanted to hear from you. Uh, in that, we would be remiss to not talk about the current realities and some of the effects of some of the political decisions that have been made recently. So last week, as I'm sure um, everyone watching knows, President Trump made a historic announcement about the status of Jerusalem, uh, declaring Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and declaring that he would be moving the United States Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, Churches for Middle East Peace is very much against that action. While we acknowledge the sacredness of Jerusalem to the Jewish people, we believe it's sacred to Muslims and Christians as well, and also that East uh, Jerusalem is occupied Palestinian territory. And so that would be our official position. We came out with a statement in response to it and maybe we'll start with you Mitri and then I know the Middle East Council of Churches Father Michel you came out with a statement as well it would be really good to hear and and Najla you know you mentioned even that there's unrest on some of the streets in Beirut um, how is this decision affecting your current realities um, maybe we'll start with you Mitri um, you know I mean uh, this decision uh, of, of President Trump uh, really uh, created uh, lots of anger uh, among uh, the Palestinian people in particular, but also uh, the larger uh, Arab and Islamic world in general, but also with many of our uh, faithful friends uh, in the US and in Europe. Uh, because, I mean, who is Trump, uh, for heaven's sake, uh, to give Jerusalem uh, and declare it, uh, uh, you know, the capital of Israel? Uh, I mean, um, uh, and, and especially using a religious language uh, catering to what is so-called the Christian right or Christian Zionism uh, to please them and to please the Israel lobby and to sacrifice uh, the Palestinian people 
and to sacrifice the Palestinian Christian community. Because our stand has been for the last uh, 40 plus years is that Jerusalem uh, is a city for two peoples and uh, for the three religions. And it cannot be a city exclusive for just one people or one religion. Uh, the nature of Jerusalem, as we hear even in the psalm, Jerusalem is the city where everyone should come together and not where one, uh, you know, take the city and others are thrown away like Sarah in the desert. We are not Sarah. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, this religious rhetoric uh, is really very dangerous because uh, it, it put oil uh, on, on a already, uh, you know, uh, very burning uh, region. Yes, and before we go on to hear from others, um, what's it like right now in Bethlehem? You know, we heard that there was uh, some significant unrest late last week. Is it quiet right now? Um, are, are there anticipation of, of more unrest? I mean, uh, just uh, like an hour ago, there were still demonstrations, there were still uh, tear gas uh, uh, and uh, live ammunition uh, fired uh, by Israeli soldiers. So, and uh, this is going on not only in Bethlehem, it's overall. In fact, I think uh, two days ago, they were, uh, they were counting 1,200 demonstrations worldwide taking place against uh, the Trump uh, uh, decision. Mm -hmm. Yes, and what does that look like in Beirut? Maybe Najla, you could tell us. You know, uh, demonstrations are close to my home as well against uh, the, what, the statement uh, that was issued by uh, President Trump. Despite the sad part of, of this and the difficult part of the statement, I want to say there's one something that's positive happening that the issue of Israel-Palestine is in the front of discussing the, the peace issue in the Middle East. I was worried for quite several years that the issue was put on the shelf and, uh, you know, the issues uh, of the war in Syria or Iraq uh, took the space and the front line. Uh, and in some way, it's important that the issue of Israel-Palestine remain uh, as the main issue in solving the peace situation uh, in the Middle East. Uh, another thing that's happening now in Beirut and in the Middle East are the different religions coming together on statements pro, you know, uh, Jerusalem. Now, as I'm speaking, one of our pastors is invited by Muslim groups to, to speak up about Jerusalem. And I feel that as Middle Easterners, it's time to speak up and uh, be united as religions in, in uh, pinpointing to its justices. Uh, I want to say uh, that even the WCRC has a statement on Jerusalem. Today, the Supreme Council of the, of the Evangelical Churches also issued in Lebanon and Syria issued a statement uh, on that. Uh, we are disturbed with, with what is between the lines of the statement. You know, I have spent enough time with the, with the statement of President Trump and he has called for a new way of dealing with things. Uh, and I was wondering how, why since 1995, this issue was not moved, you know, because it's a difficult issue, you know, uh, and he calls for moderation at a time where his statement is radical. Hmm. How do we reach, we, want, we all hope to encourage the moderate voice in the Middle East. But this is encouraged through dialogue, not through radical statements. And our concern is that how would this statement affect the peace process, affects the moderate voice in this part of the world, and affects dialogue. Because we believe solutions come through dialogues, not through imposing statements. That is leading. We are already sensing the anger on the streets, the killing, and the expressions uh, of war coming again into this part of the world. Hmm. 
That's a good encouragement um, and a powerful word, you know, that President Trump is calling for moderation when his statement is so radical. Uh, it, it represents a shift in the historic U.S. policy that's been in existence for 70 years, uh, which is quite significant. Uh, Father Michel, mm -hmm. I know the Middle East Council of Churches also is involved and has issued a statement in response to Jerusalem. What's their perspective and what are you hearing, um, you know, from other leaders within the Middle East Council of Churches? Well, in the same in the same wave as uh, Reverend Mitri and Reverend Najla, uh, we are full of anger here, Christians and Muslims, about what happened. Uh, we are disappointed because we were waiting from from the United States to be to be really a uh, leading a peace process in a uh, in a in a fair way. Uh, way. Now they put they put this decision has put. Uh, put all the Arab world in front of the in front of the fat accompli. It is done. So we cannot we cannot discuss the Jerusalem anymore. And this is is, is really this is unfair. This is unfair and this is injustice. So this is why we live this anger. And as uh, Middle East Council of Churches, we are pushed by um, by our brothers and sisters uh, Muslims to to talk about this and to make uh, a statements and uh, to help them. So they are asking from Christians to, to be helped and to, to raise our voice against, uh, against this decision. Um, in a few minutes, we'll open up the conversation. We have many people who are joining us live who will be sending in questions either via email or there's a chat function where people can uh, direct questions towards each of you. Um, I'm interested, uh, bless you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm interested, one of the things we talk about here in the U.S. context a lot is the sustainability of the church in the Middle East. You probably are familiar, Congress last year designated the treatment of Christians um, and minority groups in the Middle East a genocide. There's a lot of conversation about Muslim persecution. Um, and yet I've heard both Reverend Najla and Father Michel, you know, I've heard you say that um, your your groups are in partnership with Muslims, that there's interfaith or multi-faith work being done in response to the to the call in Jerusalem. Uh, this is an open question for whoever would like to start, but are you being persecuted by Muslims? I mean, is this a reality? Um, what can the church in the West learn from you about uh, how we can support the sustainability of the Christian community in each of your locations? Yeah. I want to say uh, the issue of, of Jerusalem is not a Muslim issue, it's a Christian issue. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's not, it's our issue, the same way it's, it's a, a Muslim issue. And uh, I believe the issue of dignity, of respecting people's minds and voices and suffering is our issue as Christians and Muslims as well. So uh, we feel uh, you know, in situations where people are oppressed and are not heard, uh, as Christians, we, we, we feel that we are fully involved. And we feel that together we have a, we live together as Christians and Muslims in the Middle East. Uh, we share this burden. And the anger is on both sides. It's not only, sometimes the Western world think it's a Muslim issue. No, it's also a Christian issue uh, in that. Uh, our relations, especially at this time, we feel stronger relations between Christians and Muslims, as I said. And this is a time, uh, as citizens of this part of the world, uh, it's a time to work together, and especially for the dignity of the people. Uh, I believe uh, lots of injustice has been happening in this part of the world. And this is another addition to that. Is, is, oh, please, Father Michel, were you going to share? Yes, while well, saying that the, the Christians are persecuted by Muslims, it's, it's, it's very, uh, very simple. We, are not, we, don't, we should not simplify issues very complicated. We are maybe persecuted, if you want, from fanatism, yes, from fundamentalism, yes. But as Muslims also are persecuted from fundamentalism. So we see many, many mosques are destroyed. We see many, many Muslims are, uh, are killed because maybe they are moderate, because they are not uh, understood, and uh, because, because they, they want the dialogue. And so we have to rely 
on this uh, on this part of the world on, on this part of Muslims that we can dialogue with them and we can we can share the same uh, the same thoughts and the same values. Uh, and uh, you know me actually that uh, I mean uh, I know that uh, many people uh, in the U.S. they they like to talk about Christian persecution by Muslims, but uh, they never want to address the situation of Palestinian Christians under occupation. Um, and this is always actually excluded. Um, even it's not on the radar screen of uh, Vice President Pence when he comes to the region. He doesn't want to hear about uh, how actually the occupation is suffocating the Palestinian Christian community here. But I don't feel persecuted actually uh, by Muslims or by many, any other group. The only... Uh, death threats I got, and I got several, believe it or not, were from Christian Zionists. These are the only group that actually uh, is all the time trying to hurt me. Hmm. Wow. Mitri, can you say a little bit more? Um, we talk a lot about occupation, occupation being the technical political term of um, the control of the Palestinian territories and also the Golan Heights from Syria. You know, but when you say the occupation is suffocating the Palestinian Christian community, how? What, what, how does that manifest itself? What does that look like for people maybe who've never traveled to the region? Help us understand. Uh, I mean, uh, look at Bethlehem. Uh, the little town of Bethlehem. Uh, this is where 50% of the Palestinian uh, Christian community in the West Bank lives. Uh, and Bethlehem as a city today is surrounded from three sides by uh, a wall that is 25 foot high. Uh, and uh, that little town is something like eight square miles only. So uh, 80, 86% of our own land has been confiscated and Israel is building uh, neighborhoods and settlements which are actually colonies uh, exclusively for the Jewish Israeli uh, and really uh, putting us in this small prison. If you want to, to visualize it, uh, it's like a piece of a Swiss cheese, you know, the Swiss cheese with the holes where basically Israel gets the cheese, that's the land and the resources and we are pushed in the holes and Bethlehem is one of these holes. And so imagine as a Christian community, if you cannot expand, if you cannot uh, build new neighborhoods, uh, uh, then you have to build, uh, you know, uh, vertically. Uh, uh, if you cannot expand, you cannot create new job opportunities. So unemployment will keep rising. With rising unemployment, you have more uh, social problems with more social problems, you have more crime with crime, you have more drugs. And this is not a catastrophe coming from heaven, but this is actually a man-made, this is a pre-programmed catastrophe by Israel so that people in Bethlehem will give up and leave. And what I'm saying is that I'm not leaving. My father refused in 67, 50 years ago when the war broke to leave because he said, I have my roots here. Uh, this is the land of Christ. This is where he wants us to be his witnesses. And we are not leaving because uh, the Holy Land needs actually the Christians and it, the, the Holy Land needs the Christians today more than ever. Hmm. Well, and we certainly are committed to seeking to support you and um, to introduce people to your stories. So thank you again, all three of you, for joining us. Um, we have about 20 minutes and we're starting to get some questions coming in. Uh, and the first one actually is uh, to you, Mitri. It says, greetings. What is the mood of students on campus? What creative responses are being used by civil society groups? I presume that that's in response to the recent decision about Jerusalem. Right. Uh, actually, I mean, uh, young people are, some of them are angry. Uh, uh, some of them feel depressed uh, because they feel that they have been betrayed. Uh, some of them uh, feel that, you know, uh, I mean, we are left alone. Uh, but then, uh, actually, uh, several of them uh, try through film and through art to, to capture uh, ideas and to, 
to communicate their story. For example, this coming Monday, uh, we are having uh, the opening um, of a, a photography uh, competition uh, for young uh, photographer. And actually, uh, some of the most amazing photographers came from Gaza. You know, you think Gaza, that's the whole destruction, that's the depression, uh, people are in a big prison, but you feel there, you give them just something, and then you have all of this creat creativity. So so this is what we are trying to do, and, and some of our students are doing really amazing films that actually people can find on YouTube uh, that talks about the situation, but in a very creative way and the creative language. Well, and I think as we're talking about Advent and the season of choosing hope, um, beauty, art, and culture, it can be transformative. I think that's one of the things that's so wonderful about your work in Bethlehem. And I heard you, Reverend Najla, you said that actually Trump's speech last week provides an opportunity, that it's opening up a conversation, uh, or at least putting the conflict between Israel and, and the Palestinians and the broader Arab world back on the you know radar screen. Can you say more about what that looks like? And, and even the question we just talked to Mitri about, you know, young people, what are young Christians in Beirut, how are they engaging? How are they seeing this conflict? Yeah, you, you know, uh, one of the of the important things uh, relating to the role of young people, you know, of, of not losing hope, and especially because I work between Lebanon and Syria, who have their own struggling in a different way. Uh, you know, uh, as Mitri said, uh, what, the difficult times make us to love our countries more and uh, to for the young people to be really uh, work hard as great potentials uh, you know of uh, putting their talents and uh, uh, believing that there will be a, a better day uh, one day uh, as i started talking about waiting for peace for sure our young people do not understand peace in this context as you know surrendering they have to do something. They first have to uh, keep their uh, zeal and, and, and uh, courage and be motivated for their role in changing the future of this part of the world. And this is where uh, I feel our young people are motivated and uh, feel they have a real cause that they are living for. And they want to dream of a better Middle East. And I think this is why they are here. And this is why they are happy in the Middle East, because as Christians, we have a role in this part of the world. And we believe that God is using us to be bridges for reconciliation, for speaking us against injustice, for believing that hope will come. These are not just nice words. These are words that we are involved in, even if that meant that there's a price we have to pay. So our young people have a great part in the future and in the present as well. And uh, their presence is a strong statement uh, that we can do a difference. We are, you know, struck, but not we did not lose hope. We have not lost hope. And uh, I think our young people are strong people, strong young people uh, who have channeled uh, their abilities in a positive way to rebuild uh, a Middle East and to dream of a Middle East uh, that has the right to live in peace. And they, as young people, have the right to stay in this part of the world. We don't want them to leave. And they have part in rebuilding that. Mm. Can you say a little bit more? You talked about having a hope for a future, and um, but then you also talked about being willing to pay a price. Uh, what do you mean by that? You know, I, I work with many Syrian uh, young people who are university students. And I tell you, their future some, many times is interrupted, education-wise, dreaming-wise, because they decided to stay here. And this is a price that they are paying, you know. Uh, also, the families are paying a price. Uh, we, we are paying of, of a price of being scared sometimes. We pay a price of uh, keep hoping to have basic dignified living for our children. 
We want our children to grow as any child in the world, with dreams and hopes, and not to feel this whole issue of security as the basic achievement. Uh, that is, this is a price of how we dream uh, in this part of the world. Hmm. Thank you for that. Um, Father Michel, um, you were talking a bit about moderation and some of um, the, the choices that either young people or those who are resisting some of the current realities have. And one of the things I heard you say was about um, how there's not persecution from Muslims, but there is persecution from extremists, but that mo both Muslims and Christians suffer from that. Can you talk a bit, you know, from your perspective with the Middle East Council of Churches and um, with your work uh, as a part, uh, you know, as a Maronite Catholic, can you talk a bit about some of those realities? Well, um, yes, I'm, I'm now actually, uh, currently I'm uh, president of a university. Mm -hmm. This university is almost divided between Christians and Muslims. So we have almost 45% are Muslims and 55% are Christians. And we see here they are united by the same uh, cause. They are united because they see there is some injustice against, uh, against our world. So this is a big opportunity to live together, to, to share the same, as I said, to share the same values, to share the same vision, for our society and for our future, uh, and this is it's, it's very important. As as uh, MECC also, we are urged by many institutions, and we are seeing that many Islamic and uh, institutions, big institutions like Al Azhar or many ulama or many imams, are um, inviting the others and are, are making big conferences. This is new in the Muslim world. This is relatively new that they are invited to make a statement, statement of peace, statement of, uh, of living together, a statement of uh, looking together and statement for the Christians. They are, they are looking in their own history where, uh, where, um, where this society has gathered all the people and still until now, so since 2000 years, or maybe more than 1,000, 1, 400 years we are living with Muslims. So why don't we, um, we underline, underline this issue, which is very important. And I think now it's, a, it's an opportunity for Muslims and for Christians to, to see the, um, the, 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 the beautiful history that we, we live together. Hmm. Thank you. That, that was yeah. a beautiful picture. We actually um, have lots of questions that have come in. Many of them many uh, relate to what's happening in Palestine. Uh, one of the questions says, how can we Christians in the U.S. more effectively awaken fellow Christians about realities affecting your communities, both in Palestine and the broader Middle East? So how, how, what would you say to Christians in the U.S.? What do you most want them to know about your realities? Uh, I think that the starting part is joining a webinar like this <laughs> to, to, to hear the other part of the story. I'm afraid that uh, uh, Christians in the US hear, hear one side of the story. And uh, it's time uh, for all of us to hear the other part of the story, to hear the, what the people on the ground you know, think. Uh, no matter how much I speak about uh, you know, Palestine, uh, you know, Dr. Mitri, he's the one living there. He's the one who's, who's struggling with it every day. And uh, he, allowing the right proper channels to hear the voices of the people, I believe this is very important, uh, empowering solidarity with the people uh, who are living here in this part of the world. So hearing the voice, uh, being open uh, to see another uh, story different from what the one that the media is carrying uh, day after day. Thank you. Um, this is a similar question. A well-known nationwide talk show host, I presume this is in the US as well, his name's Joshua Johnson. He's focusing a lot on Palestine today because of Trump's recent speech. What's, what are things that you want 
um, his audience to know. Um, you know, and this is particularly relevant because Jerusalem, you know, in the context of Christian Zionists, etc., might have different meaning than Jerusalem does for you as Middle East Christians. Uh, and so, I'm eager to hear your response to those questions. Uh, I think uh, it's really important for uh, people in the U.S. Uh, to know that uh, Palestine is not a land without a people for a people without a land. But there has been here a very vibrant community uh, throughout uh, the centuries. And that uh, the Christian community here are not uh, converts uh, by some missionaries who came from the Midwest. Uh, because uh, remember, uh, the Bible did not originate in the Bible Belt, uh, but it originated in Palestine. This is where the whole whole start, the whole story started, and so we are here to continue that story. And so I think it's really important um, for people to 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 personalize the story uh, by connecting to to Christians uh, in particular and to uh, Palestinians in general, and to Middle Easterner uh, at large. Uh, because often we have so many stereotypes in the, in the mind of people. By the way, the same applies also to us. I mean, when I speak here to many people in the Middle East, they have a stereotype about the US. Because for them, the US is just the, the administration. And for me, the US, it's the, the thousands of friends who are so faithful uh, who love Palestinians, who love the Lord, who come and visit us, uh, and uh, that we pay them visit. And so this is what we need to, to highlight. Otherwise, we create enemies, and we really are not enemies. Uh, I think it's the politicians uh, who are really selling uh, us for so cheap for their own uh, benefits. And this is, I think, what we have to resist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just want to say briefly, uh, living stones are more important than stones. And I'm afraid that sometimes people care about, you know, the Middle East as a uh, heritage or as the stones and, the, you know, the heritage. There are living stones in this part of the world. The, the, the people are the important part of the world. And this is where the value uh, of Jerusalem comes also from the people. Uh, another thing, they need to differentiate between radical Islam and Islam. Uh, we have difficulty here in this part of the world with radicalism. And I think uh, this is a, radicalism is a disease that uh, affects the whole world today. Uh, we, have, we have no problem with Islam. We have problem with radical Islam. We have no problem with Judaism. We have problem with radical Judaism, exclusivity. Even I have problem with radical Christians who exclude uh, others. So uh, radicalism, I think we have to join hands on stopping radicalism in the world that's growing uh, day after day and to be able to read between the lines, you know, about where can we uh, stand for these radical uh, statements. Uh, and I, we don't need more radicalism. We have enough in this Middle East. And this is where we were upset with radical statements coming uh, from President Trump, because we want people who encourage dialogue and who encourage moderation. Hmm. Najla, this is actually a follow-up question for you. Um, you mentioned some things about security. Um, uh, here's the question. I suspect it's the issue of suffocation um, from the Israelis, that when you were talking about security measures, that you were concerned about um, you know, some of the realities of the Israelis and the Palestinians, rather than what a typical US viewer might perceive as a security concern because of terrorism. Can you just clarify what you meant when you were talking about security issues? You know, uh, yeah, security, you know, terrorism, you know, uh, any move that uh, could uh, affect my life is an issue of security. And you know, uh, in Lebanon, we have suffered the issue of security for so many years. Uh, in, in, in Syria, our, our people also suffered the issue of security. So it's all that hinders uh, the people's living and the well-being of, of the way they live, how they are protected, 
how security means for all the people, not only for group one group of people. All the creation of God are valuable uh, in our understanding, in the eyes of God, and the security should be all, to all of them. Uh, I have three children, and I tell you, uh, uh, in, in 2006, we were concerned about our security as a family because the shells, you know, were, were falling around us. So the security, the issue of security cripples our, uh, you know, advancement as a nation and as people living here in this part of the world. We don't want to spend our life all the time just thinking of security. We want to move forward for dreaming uh, in, a, in a, a better contribution to the world, uh, dreaming of a, a better uh, Middle East that has better economic situation of cooperation and unity. So this is why security has crippled our dreams. And not on our side, on, on all sides. And this is why it's time to stop war, sit down, have a dialogue, and try to be come together, to think together. You know, we don't want people to think for other people. We want to respect that people have to, we have to, we can think together and try to really solve this issue of Israel-Palestine. Thank you. We have time um, for just a few more questions. Uh, this question relates to motivations of some American Christians. Um, they asked if we could talk a little bit more about Christian Zionists who perhaps are motivated by ideas of the rapture. Can Does one of you want to talk for a minute about Christian Zionism? Yeah, I mean, you know, Christian Zionism is, uh, was declared by churches in the Middle East uh, as a heresy uh, because uh, it really uh, only takes uh, certain verses from the Bible uh, and, re and leave out really the most important thing uh, like the cross and uh, the resurrection and uh, the incarnation. Uh, and if you look at, at Christian Zionism, actually, it has like four layers. Uh, the first layer uh, started in the mid of 19th century uh, 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 when people uh, were really dreaming of restoring the Jews, meaning uh, making them Christians. Um, and then a second layer came with the Second World War when people started talking about the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition, uh, which was actually, again, against Islam. And then after 67, uh, we have this whole uh, uh, series of uh, uh, Lonely Planet and, and other things when Christian Zionism uh, started really to flourish. Uh, and uh, the climax of it was after 77, when Likud party, uh, so in Christian Zionist allies, actually anti-Semite themselves, but uh, the Likud party people thought uh, they wouldn't mind sharing bed with them as, as, as long as they fulfill some of their financial desires. Uh, and we are paying the price of this kind of, of, of uh, Zionism, uh, Christian Zionism, because the Christian Zionism actually, they believe in in a God which I feel is not our God uh, because the God we believe in is the incarnated God. It's the divine that became human in Bethlehem 2000 years ago, which means every human being actually uh, is sacred. A life at, at, at large is sacred and there is no way actually to violate human rights in the name of divine rights. This is totally uh, not possible, but for Christian Zionists, that is that is fine. They want to bring the Jews here to Palestine so that two thirds of the Jews will be killed here, and the rest will convert to Christianity. I mean, what kind of thinking is this? This is a sick thinking, and unfortunately, President Trump and Vice President Pence are actually uh, uh, working uh, within this uh, very dangerous uh, agenda. 
Um, one of the things, just in terms of my own personal background, I'm ordained in the Evangelical Covenant Church. Uh, so it's one of the few evangelical denominations that ordains women. And I have a conservative understanding of the scriptures and yet believe Christians cannot read the words of Jesus and have a viewpoint that does not acknowledge the dignity and the inherent human rights of all people living in the Holy Land. And so even from a conservative theological perspective, you know, I think that the whole of scripture would teach, Jesus not only says, love your neighbor, right? Um, but also to love your enemy. And so not that we need to, to go down into, you know, some of the weeds of theology, but I think it's important, you know, we lead an ecumenical organization that's across theological spectrums. And one of the things that's so beautiful of our 27 denominations is they've come together to say we are committed to protecting the human rights of all people in the land and also our Christian heritage and the sacredness of Jerusalem and, um, right. and... Uh Yes, and, and you know, me. I mean, the problem with Christian Zionists is that there are so many lies. Like uh, you know, Hege was just saying this week that there is a prophecy that in the year 2017, uh, Jerusalem will be you know recognized as the capital of the state of Israel. I mean, where is that in the Bible? I mean, you know, uh, this is a fundraiser who is using the Bible, you know, for everything else but the message of Christ. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I think I think I have to about about this uh, Zionist Christians. We have two big problems with them. This is an ideology. The first problem it's it is an ideology. It's not based on reality. It's not based on peace. Peace. It's not to impose peace. We cannot impose peace. We have to build a peace. And building peace, we have to talk together. We have to be together. We have to accept the other. We have to respect human rights. This is the main problem of these Christians. And the other second, they are influent, influent in media, in politics. So they impose their uh, own view. And, and this is the main, main difficulty. And this is why what, what uh, Reverend uh, Mitri said, from, from the Middle East, we see that the, the, the Americans as, as only, only the class, the politics class, we cannot even distinguish because we receive only this imposing this this kind of peace yes thank you father michel so our time is very quickly coming to an end um this question uh, is for mitri and then i'll have a question for all of you um people here are saying why are palestinian leaders pushing for demonstrations when they know that israel will push back and there will be violence how should we answer that <coughs> Uh, you know, I, I think I think peaceful demonstrations are something that I think uh, is very important. I mean, that is one uh, you know nonviolent uh, tool of resistance. I mean, we saw what nonviolent uh, demonstration were able to do in Eastern Germany, for example. Uh, you know, they brought the wall down, uh, and so I think we need more than this, uh, more like this. Uh, but not uh, violent demonstration, uh, because that uh, is culturally and religiously is, doesn't fit into our into our perspective. But yes, we need we need people actually to speak up their mind collectively, because uh, then and only then the world will hear. Otherwise, you know, no one will take notice. And is that part of what you meant, Reverend Najla, when you said that Christians in the region have to be willing to pay the cost? Yes, because, you know, as Christians, we have to, we are integrate with the way, we don't believe in violence in this way, but I always uh, hope that people are not pushed into violence. Because when people are not heard, what can they do? I never excuse violence, but I want people to, to see, to stand in the shoes of people who have been for so many years living in difficult situations with no nation, with no rights, with difficult economic situation. How do we solve that? And you know what concerns me with our worldly attitude is that we are too slow. There is an element of urgency that we should know that people are suffering 
whether in Syria or in Palestine or in Iraq or in Israel, we don't have all the time to think slowly about these things. And the world has been too slow in that. Generations are growing in anger, in depravity, in humiliation. And you know, for a child who's born and raised in humiliation, what do you expect? What do we expect? We have to stop and move fast into dialogues that create spell out what justice is you know i think all hermeneutics should be discerned under justice under the shalom of the people the well-being of the people we cannot uh, just you know throw ideas that lead people to live in an indignified way and when they get angry we are shocked people people have the right to live as dignified people. And I hope that uh, this meeting today would move us all towards serious involvement in finding a way towards peace, a way that grants people dignity and grants people to have the right to live like any child in the world who, whose concern is to live in a dignified way, not only to live and to survive. May it be so. That's a good prayer. Martin Luther King Jr. said that riots are the cry of the oppressed because they've been unheard, uh, which made me think of what you were talking about in yes. terms of listening to the cries yes. of people. Um, so this is a question that will be the last question, and each of you will have the opportunity to answer it. It's a couple of questions combined. Um, one person wrote, we admire the three of you. We pray for peace and justice in the Middle East. We share your anger and dismay about President Trump recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Besides, of course, praying, what else can US Christians do? And then another question, uh, again, for each of you is, what is your message to Christians in the United States in this season of Advent? So we'll start with you, Father Michel, if we may. Uh, yes, well, we, we are talking about hope, and hope is a, a, a virtue. This is very important for us, and without hope we cannot live. And, uh, and Christ came to our, to our land to give us hope. So uh, first of all, we, we, say, we ask prayer. Prayers are, is, is very, very important for us and for, for the unity of the Christians in the same time and for this world. But second, we can ask a pressure. We can ask some like um, awareness, make awareness about the situation of the Christians in uh, in this land. Make awareness in the in the in the United States about what we are living here, and not just uh, receiving from the media what what they tell us. So a webinar like this, we can um, we can explain better the situation from the real people, from the from the people living with the, with the, with the others. So I think uh, this is, could be could be a very important and you know a pressure about uh, on, on on the politics uh, class is, uh, is is important also because we cannot accept the reality as it is. We we heard uh, yesterday Mr. Netanyahu telling us that uh, peace begins with uh, with accepting reality, recognizing reality. It's not true. Mm -hmm. It's not true. It's not recognized by recognizing re reality. When reality, it um, uh, gives us many, many injustice, anger, and uh, and really depression. So we have we have to change the reality if it's a a a, a bad reality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, how about for you, Mitri? Uh, I think beside uh, beside prayers. Uh, which are really very important because we need them, uh, especially at times like this. Um, I like to speak of three other P's. Uh, so uh, pilgrimages. Uh, we need more groups from the U.S. to come and visit Palestine, visit Lebanon, visit Syria, if possible. You know, visit the region and to meet uh, the living stones and to hear, to see it, and to hear firsthand what's happening on the ground. Pilgrimages are really very important. The third P uh, is political advocacy. Uh, because, you know, I, I, I am often 
on the Hill meeting with uh, members of Congress. And they often tell me, you know, uh, we have every week somebody from the other side coming to pressure us, but we don't see your friends coming uh, who are our constituency to tell us that they care for you. So I think we need more uh, people to be to speak out uh, with their Congress, uh, members of Congress. And the fourth P are projects. Uh, you know, pick a project to support uh, supporting the Christians of the Middle East, not only to survive, but to thrive, because I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of my friends like always to say that diamonds are made under pressure. And believe me, we have so many pressures uh, around us, but this is where diamond is done. And I think you can be part of that success story. That's a wonderful in invitation. And for people watching, um, Churches for Middle East Peace, we're on Capitol Hill almost every week, Mitri. We uh, also have been doing some um, uh, congressional um, briefings and things. I just did one on the reality of settlements with uh, the mayor of Bethlehem and the mayor of Wadi Fukin. And so we would encourage those watching to go to Churches for Middle East Peace's website, www.cmep.org. Uh, and we have information about each of your ministries as well. So our three goals are to educate to elevate voices like yours and ministries like yours, and then to advocate to really seek to shift American policy. So Reverend Najla, bring us home. What is your word to the churches here in the US? <laughs> I just want to say we are uh, the one body of Jesus Christ with the churches of the US. And as, a, as I head the world communion of our uh, reformed churches, many of our churches are in the, the US and we feel the solidarity uh, with them. What do I want from the churches is to speak up. And I think sometimes to speak up and not to cal calculate the outcome. Sometimes we calculate the outcome so we end up to be silent. I believe we need this courageous leap of strength uh, to speak up and say our opinion. And our opinion that's Christ-like. What would Christ do in a situation that we are in and have the courage to, to, say, to say it. Also, as I mentioned before, to tell the story, I think stories of living people makes a difference that this is, this we're talking about living people here. We are talking about human beings who are suffering. The last, be practical. I always see justice is putting our faith in practical steps. And sometimes people, for sure, we they want, prayers for sure we need to pray together but all of us the church in the east and west we are challenged to be practical how would our life change the situation of injustice of other people's lives and this is a struggle for all of us uh, in the east and in the west hmm. Thank you. And if people are eager to hear more from Reverend Najla, I'm so pleased as she'll be joining us as one of our keynote speakers for our June Advocacy Summit, which is called End Still We Rise, and it's featuring women in peace building. And so I'm sorry, Mitri and Father Michel, that um, you're more than welcome to come, uh, but Reverend no, Najla will be elevated. You know, Najla is the best representation that we can <laughs> ask for. <laughs> One day I, 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 speak, I, I, I will speak in Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, each of you. Um, blessings to you this Advent. We commit to not only praying, but also for working toward peace. Uh, and so Godspeed to each of you in your ministries. We're really grateful for your time, and we'll continue to point people to come and visit uh, and to advocate and to tell your stories. So thank you very much thank for being you. with us. Thank you, May, thank for you, this thank creative you. idea uh, of the webinar and for all what you are doing. Uh, yes. In DC. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Blessings to you as well. Thank you.